tonight I'm gonna be talking about the energy transition and clean transportation. So in just this year, we've seen dramatic changes to economic, healthcare, travel, public transit, transportation, food and entertainment sectors fallout as a result of interruptions to supply chains and business operations of all sizes and mental health impacts such as Zoom fatigue from transitions to working, teaching and learning from home. It has been a chaotic year with COVID-19 causing more disruption than any other event in recent history, not only for public health, but also for the global energy system. Although global emissions are projected to bounce back slower after the two than after the 2008 financial crisis, a sustainable recovery is long way off. What remains to be seen is whether responses from governments to this upheaval will help or hinder efforts to accelerate clean energy transitions and reach international energy and climate goals. Energy itself is a basic human need. It's critical for society, it's the backbone for the way we live. In many ways, it's the lifeblood of modern society. So let me ask you, what if all the energy in the world just disappeared? Without it, we don't have food, clean water, transportation, and access to healthcare. Humans are not going to change their desire for energy to support their modern lives. They're not going to say, oh no, we don't need energy. We don't need our technology. As modern humans, we certainly want it and we want more of it. Have you ever thought about how much energy you actually use on a daily basis and how much carbon emissions you produce? Well, about five years ago, I went online and ran the calculations from my ecological footprint. You have to input data on your household, including number of members, type of home, et cetera. So I have a rather large home for myself, my two children and three cats. Um, so I was a bit shocked at my carbon output. So I started fiddling with the numbers, the inputs, right? I realized that if all bedrooms were shared by two people and I converted larger living spaces into bedrooms, I can have up to eight people live in my home. And all of a sudden my carbon emissions drop significantly. Such a dramatic change to the number of people living in my home produced a dramatic decrease in my personal carbon footprint but solutions to carbon emissions need to be addressed at every single scale. The urgency of tackling emissions remains. So regardless of the challenges that we have, net zero emissions is increasingly the desired outcome sought globally. Ambitious pathways have been mapped out by countries and companies with plans to hit their net zero emissions targets on time and in full. So let's talk about what would be needed to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. Dramatic actions over the next decade. To achieve 40% emissions reductions by 2030, 75% of global electricity generation would need to be from low emission sources by 2030. That's 10 years from now. In 2019, there was less than 40% from low emission sources globally. This would mean an over 35% increase is needed over the next 10 years. Also, net zero emissions by 2050 would mean increasing sales of passenger electric vehicles from 2.5% in 2019 to more than 50% worldwide by 2030. Failure to mitigate these problems will cause irreversible damage to the entire planet. Under current policy scenarios, the world is not set for such pivotal reduction in emissions. If stronger sustainable policies are endorsed, emissions can fall to zero by 2070. Current global 2050 net zero assurances, China's 2060 net zero goals allow for progress toward this goal, but this only gets us part of the way. To reach um, net zero by 2050, massive efforts need to be enacted over the next decade. These would include electrification, energy efficiency, innovation and advances in technology, and ultimately changes in human behavior. All parts of the energy ecosystem need to be in play simultaneously since there's not enough time to make up the difference or any losses. The sustainable recovery plan 
proposed by the International Energy Agency, supports rapid growth of solar, wind, and energy efficiency technologies. It embraces a post-crisis path to net zero in the next 10 years, and also requires major investments and scale-up efforts for hydrogen, carbon capture utilization and storage, and a renewed momentum for nuclear power. But what can we learn from previous energy transitions? So today's disruptive technologies and digital strategies have upended the historic 50 year timescale of transitions in energy sources, carriers and impacts. Clean energy, sustainability targets and consumer oriented paradigms all emergent themes of the 1970s and 1980s are now urgent considerations as climate change increasingly leaves its mark. Transportation and the electricity grid are only experiencing transitions to cleaner and more sustainable operations driven by advanced technologies such as electricity storage, digital revolutions including big data and blockchain, and consumer preferences such as mobility services and personalized energy informatics. So electrification paired with the vigor of the digital and data era are accelerating opportunities to materialize energy transitions for transportation and the grid and their respective roles in a decarbonized future. Another energy transition to look at is solar. What can we learn from solar success? Solar will play a central role in transitioning to a decarbonized future. Supportive policies, maturing technologies are making solar PV consistently cheaper than any new coal or gas fired power plant in most regions, with some solar genera generation providing the lowest cost electricity in recent decades. There is much to be learned from the success of solar. In order to prepare for the energy transition, we need to understand the outcome of the energy conundrum, emissions. So let's talk about the resultant product of our modern lifestyles, carbon emissions. Let's talk about how it appeared to be peaking at one point, but it continues to rise and has a direct correlation to how we as a society use energy. Emissions will continue to increase over time, regardless of the current dips in it. We will return to pre-COVID-19 levels in just a few years. Therefore, we require a clear and economical pathway for clean net zero energy sources. For that, we need to take a closer look at the US power generation system. Across the US, natural gas has already displaced coal in recent years as the main electricity generating fuel. Non-hydro renewables, solar and wind, continue to increase as costs come down and policies support further development. In fact, there have been brief moments when renewable electricity generation surpassed coals since 2019. We are becoming increasingly willing to generate and deploy renewable energy sources versus dirty fossil fuel plants. But this remains only a very small portion of our entire electricity grid. Dramatic change for the electricity grid is on its way with a strong spike in renewable deployment in the last decade supporting this effort. Although costs for renewables have been falling over the last decade and continue to fall, renewables are not without their own set of challenges. One critical weakness of renewables is intermittency. The wind doesn't always blow and the sun does not always shine. This is where energy storage comes in. When renewables are paired with storage, it adds more value to the overall system and costs fall faster together. Adding storage to the grid alone or pairing it with renewables can produce dramatic results for renewable deployment and ultimately the clean energy transition. Another great benefit to battery storage is zero fuel cost. Batteries are simply a technology and have only capital costs. So there's no long-term fuel costs such as diesel, gasoline, methane, those don't need to be considered. Storage costs have already de decreased considerably and will continue to do so. In fact, costs have fallen much faster for storage than they have for renewables. The main reason for this faster drop in costs is, in is the demand for storage. It continues to increase, right? Just think about how many batteries you use on a daily basis. We're finding more ways to deploy, implement, and integrate batteries across society, 
industries, not just the grid and cars. We use them in our smartphones, laptops, and other work, education, and household goods. The medical sector, logistics, buildings are all increasingly using battery technologies. Besides batteries and solar, let's take another closer look at the grid itself. Where is it currently? We know it's not so clean. Where should it be going? We'd like it to be at net zero. And how do we get there? So let me ask you, do you know which sectors use the most energy and produce the most emissions? It's industrial and transportation. They are the largest consumers of energy. And within transportation sector itself, 90% is attributed to petroleum usage, 90%. The US transportation sector is certainly ripe for transformation through electrification. So let me ask you, where should we focus our efforts for transportation electrification? Some parts of the four energy consuming industries like you'd see here, transportation, industrial, residential and commercial are already electrified while others are not. The industrial sector has its unique set of challenges for achieving net zero emissions. However, the entire transportation sector is lagging behind. Dramatic action toward electrification is needed for the transportation sector. Within transportation, light duty vehicles, also known as passenger cars, they represent over 55% of the energy consumption and are the largest energy consumer. Passenger cars provide the greatest opportunity to provide clean and electric transportation and to partner with a net zero clean grid of the future. I mean, after all, can't you see yourself in an electric car in the next decade? So let's think a little bit about what transitioning cars to all electric means and what that means for the grid itself. Energy consumption trends across sectors shows increased electricity demands, but those changes are not coming from industrial, residential or commercial sectors. Take a look at this. What we are seeing is the introduction of a new electricity consumer, the transportation sector. Achieving a cleaner transportation future will impact the electricity grid and the demand for additional new generation of electricity will be coming from transportation as we electrify cars and other vehicles. This represents a dramatic change to our current electricity demands and requires solutions within the next decade. But other transportation emitters need solution too. The cost challenge for transportation electrification is dissipating. Different subsections within transportation have different costs. So for light duty vehicles, passenger cars, we're already there when it comes to the levelized cost of driving. But cost hurdles continue for medium duty vehicles and heavy duty trucks and buses. Fuel costs may be lower, but infrastructure costs are much higher. For example, charging infrastructure for public transit buses costs just as much as the buses themselves. So when budgeting for electric buses, initial costs must be doubled. That's a huge expense. But can you imagine cities full of electric buses instead of those polluting diesel buses? Less noise, cleaner air. The entire transportation sector faces considerable challenges to achieve net zero emissions. Batteries will only serve part of the transportation sector though, not all of it. Some of you may have already been in an electric car or bus, but what about electric plane? Can you imagine all electric flight? Is this even possible with our current battery technology? So current electric cars have multiple battery packs, each with about 200 watt hours per kilogram of energy which allows electric vehicles to travel approximately 300 ground miles per charge. But how much energy will have to be stored to fly a plane to travel that same distance in the air? At least four times that amount. With the current battery technology, we'll have to wait until 2055 to take such flights. We cannot and should not wait that long. Dramatic action is needed to decarbonize transportation. It's required through the development of alternative clean fuels, especially for vehicles where batteries cannot provide immediate solutions. The energy transition relies heavily on the transition to clean transportation. 
In fact, transportation electrification is well on its way and has been for the last decade. But a rapid transformation is only projected to emerge from mass deployment of autonomous vehicles, since autonomous vehicles will bring full electrification. That means maybe in 10 to 15 years, cities will be filled with autonomous but electric vehicles. Getting to net zero clean energy transportation will be a challenge and requires a multitude of solutions. The next generation must address this, must produce this trend um, for the transition to happen. I do wanna point out that transitions can and do happen very quickly. Take a look at this parade in New York City in 1900 and then again in 1913. It went from one car among all horse-drawn carriages in 1900 to only one horse-drawn carriage among a street full of cars only 13 years later. Imagine that in 13 years, there was a complete transition of the transportation sector. This means that dramatic action over the next decade is not only possible, it is achievable and not only for the transportation sector, but the entire energy ecosystem. Thank you very much.